apartheid in South Africa. First time I listened to this speech was the brown paper wrap, much more dimly lit room. Of course, then we understood, as we understand now, that King obviously stood for justice and peace for everybody, everywhere. And, and that message is still uh, true. But <clears throat> I want to recover um, some vocabulary, vocabulary um, that I think is more or less seem to have gone with the wayside with anything else. I want to uh, suggest that the metaphor of apartheid, which is, is still one of the most useful ways to view the world right now. In fact, as uh, John Polger, some of you may know the British uh, journalist, has eloquently uh, written that apartheid didn't die at the, at the time of Mandela. In fact, it's become globalized. So we're now dealing with a much more, if you look at the structure of the global economy, we have one-fifth generally European, um, uh, American, white, uh, consuming four-fifths of the world's resources, right? And four-fifths non-European people having to deal with one. So we have this type, and it's deepening. Inequality is deepening. So what can that mean at this moment where we might be moving into a kind of colorblind inequality, colorblind racism? How does racism matter? So I thought, and what is inspiration can, um, can, can one suggest? And or draw from, from uh, King's speech. So there are two things I think that are moving, of course, for me about King's speech. The part where he talks about the revolution in the values. So that's a key, a key part. And I think he perceptively talks about moving from a thing oriented society to a people oriented mm -hmm. society. That's the point about that people matter. I think Paul's comment earlier about the level of detail, for me, it's also about being able to see things from the peasant point of view. Is always and then linking it to the to the to the broader structure. So, where in history are there lessons to be learned about difference, or I think by and large the indifference of the international community to human suffering, and in this particular case, um, um, I mean the 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 the, the, the uh, unnecessary harm that's being. I mean, was this war in Gaza necessary? That's part of the question you want to ask. So. Uh, the indictment, some of you will remember, the UN Rapporteur on Human Rights, uh, Richard Falk, um, was forbidden just before the onslaught. And of course, Falk, I think, should be uh, celebrated, of course, with other stalwarts, Amy Goodman in particular, as condemning the current system as one of Israeli apartheid. Because that's the metaphor that needs to be understood and explained. I think he's not singularly with Jimmy Carter as well, the Carter Human Rights Movement. So the apartheid matter is, is still useful because I think it does two things. One, it begins to give for us in the civil society, the transnational advocacy movements, a language through which we can again mobilize a normative and model indignation against this, this system. Right? By declaring it, like apartheid in South Africa, a crime against humanity. That was very important to mobilize and to displace South Africa as a pariah. I think the second thing that is useful about thinking through that language is it set up the platform for the call against sanctions and disinvestment against the current Israeli state. It's not, I mean, an open secret that the current state, the political economy, is Israel two or three months with economic sanctions. They won't be, or with military sanctions, right? It's, it's, it's not going to, it won't be able to be the perpetrator of the violent crimes that, that uh, at the moment. The other part I think about why it's useful to start thinking about this in the metaphor of the global apartheid and to revive this is to begin to underpin the racist undertones yeah. right, that underlie this. Because we are dealing here with, in addition to the multiple crises, it's, it's the, the racist uh, underpinnings of this crisis. And King talks about this also in relation to the colonial dimensions. Right? I mean, the violence, and this is Franz Fanon, also speaking, you know, again, in King's speech to fellow citizens, talks about, you know, the, I mean, colonialism as the, as the founding violence. It's the founding violence of, of Western modernity. Right? And the methodology for prosecuting that is you know, of the local movers is to make clear the, lo the uh, international and global underpinnings of local disparities. The, the violence that's being suffered here, and King talks about this in the ghettos of the North, all right? and the fact is that Obama comes to take office at a time when there's the greatest inequality in American society. So one of the key struggles right now of social movements um, at this juncture, I think, historically, is the struggle against residential segregation. But let me 
conclude on a movement that I know a little bit more about, which is the environmental movements. I think the slogan of the anti-slavery movements was, and coming back to this brotherhood and fellowship was, am I not a man and a brother? This was, if you look at the memorabilia, that was, that was again, it's recovering the, the humaneness of that uh, tradition, right? So what exactly did it mean to be a brother and a brotherhood and a man? This was, this was, this was part. But also, poems were written at that time where uh, destiny by uh, you know, slaves like, of course, Douglas here and Equiano uh, uh, in the Caribbean was that we are the sweetness in your sugar, we are the sugar in your tea. I think that's a very useful way to think about because sometimes these things are all abstract. So once we begin to see the misery and suffering, right, in the production of things like sugar, and this is what the anti-slavery movement used to show, mm -hmm. and I think similarly, we in the environmental movement, which has moved from the protection of resources to look at the cultural politics of our lifestyle, need to remind ourselves and send the message out that the gas that we put in the cars is not cheap. It's not the price that's paid at the pump. Right? There's a whole baggage of suffering with every gallon of gas that goes and the consumptive lifestyles that people generally in the affluent north have. So the environmental movement now needs to, I think, move from a conservation to, of resources to a reduction in consumption. I think the economic crisis, in some ways, was actually very you know, good for the environment, apart from the other miseries it, it visited on people. But I think beginning to link in a very practical and concrete ways, the human suffering and cost of the everyday commodities. And I think once we begin to couple the social and human suffering with the technological affluence that we so celebrate here, that's what I think the environmental movement can make its contribution to, to linking and understanding the unnecessary suffering that's being, that's being produced.